evening, everybody. Welcome to this Sunday evening meeting of the Lighthouse Baptist Church. Let's all take a hymn. We'll stand together and turn to hymn 288. That's 288. Hymn 288. I am resolved no longer to linger. Hymn 288. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to Resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one, he is the just one, he hath the words of life. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will come to thee. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth, he is the living way. I will hasten to him, hasten so glad and free. Jesus, greatest, highest, I will. Amen. Welcome back this evening, and uh, I hope you got a good Sunday afternoon nap. That's, that's one good thing about this type of weather. It seems to bring on those naps uh, and makes them feel a little, a little deeper maybe, I guess. But uh, anyway, appreciate you being back tonight. And before we pray, do remember uh, Mrs. Lou's uncle that been, we've been praying for. He did pass away, so let's pray for the family. Uh, and he passed away. And then, of course, Brother Marvin, let's continue to pray for him. Uh, and then if you don't mind praying for my wife, this low pressure system that's kind of over us, I think it was reported in the news that this is the worst low pressure that we've ever had around here. And uh, she's feeling it uh, with her autoimmune stuff. It just amplifies that. So she's not doing well tonight. So if you don't, remind, don't mind, let's pray for her as well. So let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. And Lord, we do thank you for the great morning you gave us, Lord, and with all the visitors. And uh, Lord, I just ask you to uh, bless and speak to their hearts. And Lord, I just ask you to be with uh, uh, Miss Lou's family, Lord, who was passing away of her uncle. Lord, I just ask you to comfort the family in only the way that you can. And Lord, we thank you the, that we do know he was saved and was, he was a great Christian man. And Lord, he, he's with you now, but Lord, we do ask you to touch the family, bless them. Uh, be with Brother Marvin, continue to strengthen him. And Lord, I do ask you to be with Sharon, Lord, I just ask you to touch her body, give her strength. And Lord, be with us tonight. Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit as I preach, Lord, and teach about the Word of God. And Lord, I ask you to be with all of us as we listen. Lord, help us to be able to learn some truths from your Word in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All righty. I'll go through our announcements real quick. Uh, we'll just do October's, I guess. Uh, tonight, it's, uh, of course, the 1st and the 15th is the Ladies Bible Study uh, here at the church. And then the 12th and 26th is a church-wide soul winning. Then this coming Saturday is our fall festival at 5 o'clock. I know there's a couple that's already signed up for the chili back there, and, and uh, look forward to that, and then hopefully a couple more sign up. And then, uh, we, of course, in November, we got several things going on there. And then Miss Megan's birthday was tomorrow. And I think that's about it. Bro. <laughs> so I'll take a hymn, and we'll stand again, please. Let's turn to hymn 296. M296, M296, down in the valley, let's sing together, 296, down in the valley with my Savior I would go, where the flowers are blooming and the sweet waters flow, everywhere he leads me I would follow, follow on, walking in his footsteps till the crown be won, follow, follow. Follow Jesus anywhere, everywhere. I would follow on. Follow, follow. I will follow Jesus everywhere He leads me. I would follow on. Down in the valley with my Savior I would go. Where the storms are sweeping and the dark waters flow. With His hand to lead me, I will never, never fear. 
Danger cannot fright me if my Lord is near. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow on. Down in the valley or upon the mountain steep, Close beside my Savior would my soul ever keep. He will lead me safely in the path that he has trod. Up to where they gather on the hills of God. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Anywhere, everywhere, I would follow on. Follow, follow, I would follow Jesus. Everywhere he leads me, I would follow. Amen. You can be seated. <clears throat> and we'll take our Bibles and we'll turn to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. <clears throat> and we had started uh, some Sunday night's things on, in the book of Matthew. And then, of course, we had some missionaries and so forth. And, and uh, Brother Jackson. And, <clears throat> and so it's been a couple of weeks since we preached out of Matthew, but, but uh, we'll get back on it tonight. Uh, we started, I guess, several weeks ago, and we preached the, basically the overview of Matthew, how that uh, the book of Matthew presents Jesus Christ as king, and you know, the other gospels present him as a different you know, son of man, and son of God, and so forth, and a servant. Uh, but Matthew presented him as the king of kings, and we saw how he fit that bill. As far as uh, with the genealogies and so forth. Uh, and then we, we preached on the king's birth. And how that, that was prophecy being fulfilled. And of course that's how God uh, designed it. That he would be born of a virgin and wear and, and all the things that took place. And we saw that. And then the last time we preached out of the book of Matthew. We saw the cr king's credentials. Uh, how that he obviously could fulfill uh, the, the, the law. And he, how he could pay for our sins. And. Uh, all the credentials that he had, uh, he was worthy of uh, fulfilling all those uh, specific things that God wanted him to feel, fulfill, and we saw his credentials. And so tonight, uh, we'll start uh, with the king's principles, uh, the king's principles, and we'll, we'll do three, uh, I guess, if, if, it, if it works out, three Sunday nights in a row, we'll preach on the king's principles, and we'll see tonight uh, true righteousness. Uh, you know, again, a lot of people... Uh, they'll, they'll even use that word as kind of a slang word. You know, it was pretty popular. Righteous. Uh, they would say stuff like that. And so we know that there, uh, you know, people use that word and they have different meanings for it and things like that. But we're going to look at true righteousness. Uh, none of us <clears throat> can have it in ourselves. We need Jesus uh, to have true righteousness. And we're going to look how to get it, how to apply it, uh, how to appreciate it. We're going to look at some things like that in the book of uh, Matthew chapter 5. And so we'll look at true righteousness the following uh, Sunday night. If uh, uh, it works out, we'll be, uh, we'll be preaching on the King's Principles, true worship. And of course, there's a lot of opinions on worship today uh, and how to do it and why we should do it and uh, you know, what will be the cause of doing it and things like that. But we'll look at true worship according to uh, God in the Bible in Matthew chapter 6 next week. Uh, and then the next week we'll do a uh, true judgment and of course the Bible says I know we're not supposed to judge uh, but that's talking about specifically the wheats and the tares or if a person saved or lost that's that's not up to us because uh, I have seen people that most likely were saved but they live and they look and they act and they talk like they're not so if I look at the situation I would say you know that oh definitely not saved but they may have gotten saved they may have just been backslidden and the Bible teaches that they can get to the point that it'll look like they're not saved uh, and then I've seen people, you know, they, they, they dot every I, cross every T, they, they're, they're respect, you know, respectful, they, you know, they dress right, look right, talk right, uh, you know, maybe even have a, you know, King James under their arm or whatever, you know, of course that person's saved, <laughs> but they've never asked Jesus Christ to save them. Uh, so that's what we're not supposed to judge. The other things we can maybe not be judgmental, but uh, I, I believe the Bible uh, leans toward maybe fruit inspection. And uh, if, you know, if that person is saved and that person is a good friend and that person, you know, will iron sharpen it iron and help, help our relationship, uh, they're, they're producing fruit. And I can, I can be a fruit inspector. 
uh, inspector. And so uh, obviously we know the uh, husbandman of the vineyard, that's what his job was, was to fruit inspect. Here's a tree that's not producing fruit, so let's chop it down uh, and cast it in the fire and plant a tree right here that will do some fruit bearing. And maybe the person that planted that tree and loves that vineyard said, whoa, no, time out, let's, let's dung it and let's see if we can prune it and let's see if we can get back around and things like that. So all that, uh, that true judgment, we are supposed to, uh, and again, the, you know, the Bible says, be not unequally yoked. So if I don't have a little bit of judgment, you know, that person's not saved, so I don't want to date them or marry them or go into business with them. So I have to use that judgment. And so we'll look at that in a couple weeks. But Matthew 5 is where we are tonight. So just leave it open to Matthew 5 because we'll jump in there and I'll jump back out. And we'll jump back in there and I'll jump back out. Uh, we'll do that. Uh, but just to, I guess, give us some, some thoughts about Matthew 5 out there. Uh, again, these first couple obviously are not true. Uh, but we'll look at the, uh, the, the, the different thoughts of Matthew 5 out there. But it is known uh, you know, typically as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, if you've ever heard the, the phrase where Jesus was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, this is where it's found. Uh, it starts here in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, it's also known as the book of the Beatitudes. Uh, be this and be this and be this and be this. Our attitude about something. So if you was wanting to know where's the, where's the Beatitudes found? Matthew chapter 5. Where's the Sermon on the Mount found? It's Matthew chapter 5. And so that those Beatitudes is where the ver verse says, Blessed is the man that does this and blessed is the man does this and blessed is the man does this that would be that our attitude and if we look at it in that way and we have that attitude God says we can be blessed and so that's where it's found so some have said that the book of Matthew chapter 5 uh, was full of rules and if we want to make it to heaven we must obey them all <laughs> therefore making it a work salvation and so <clears throat> some religions out there that do teach that you know the only way you can get to heaven is if you're you know if you dot every I and cross every T and you you know, you check, you've got a checklist and you know, every day you do this and every day you do that. Uh, but the Bible says, God forbid on that. It's not of works, lest any man should boast, but it's a gift of God. So we know that it's not the rules and the regulations that we have to keep to get saved. Uh, that would be a work salvation. Some have said uh, that it's, it's a chapter for world peace. And again, that's a catchphrase out there that everybody throws out, especially if you're a candidate for the presidency or, or any other uh, government agency, you know, world peace, world peace. And that's what people think they want. Uh, but of course, the Bible says that, you know, when Jesus comes back, it's not going to be a peaceful world. Uh, it's going to get worse and worse. And so we just need to leave that in the hands of God. And uh, uh, again, I, I'm always this way, be a part of the solution, not a part of the problem. So don't just say, well, you know, the world is w wicked and the world is going to, you know, go to hell in a handbasket, all that kind of stuff. So what's the use? No, we don't want to do that. Throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, but that's what some people say, you know, the only way that we can have world peace is everybody would get into Matthew 5 and be blessed and do all these rules uh, and, and so forth. Uh, we ought to do that. Again, that's just what some say. Some say also that it's not for our day. Uh, it's for a future you know, so they don't, you, you know, we ought not live like this today. We, we need to live like this during the tribulation or during, during the millennial and things like that. Again, wrong. Uh, we need to live like this today. Uh, God will bless us if we live like this today. He will bless us today. Uh, anyway, so now, that's all, well, all some that say that, that that's what Matthew 5 is about. It's not. Here's what it's about. <laughs> the true theme of Matthew chapter 5 is what we've already announced is true righteousness. In other words, it's not a made-up righteousness to achieve salvation. It's not works. It's coming from a heart of a saved person that wants to please God. That's where true righteousness comes from. <laughs> and so when I, when I uh, react a certain way, again, it's probably not me. No, there's no probably about it. It's not me. It's the Holy Spirit living inside of me helping me produce that righteous reaction. Same thing, if I go in to do something that's a good thing, a good work, but I'm just doing it for that self-gratification or that maybe that public recognition. That's not true righteousness. I didn't do it for the right reason. I may have gotten the pat on the back or I may feel self-gratification, but that's burned up, the Bible says. So that's not true righteousness. You're not living righteous for the right reason. True righteousness is just doing right because it's right to do. And we realize God's looking at us, God will bless us, and things like that. So that's what true righteousness is. And so the Matthew chapter 5, uh, it will help us to act, react, live righteously. True righteous, not 
Not pharisaicalism, not work salvation, uh, not better than now, not self-gratification, not pats on the back. It's just true righteousness. So because of these religious leaders of this time, those Pharisees and those scribes, they had what they called an artificial external righteousness. In other words, they were doing the right thing, but it wasn't, they, they weren't right. The only reason they were doing it was because people were watching, or they had a position, or they were trying to show off their Christianity. So it wasn't true. It was artificial. Uh, and some things are easy to tell that they're artificial. I don't know if you've ever been in your grandmother's house, went up to the fruit basket, grabbed you an apple, and took you a big old bite of styrofoam. All right? Uh, it looked real. Uh, you know, but you took that bite. Oh, <laughs> it's not what it seems. Uh, that was artificial. Uh, and again, uh, there, you know, I would, I'd love to eat a real apple, all right, but I'm not eating an artificial one. Uh, there's a big difference. And so, uh, you know, some people that have experienced that, like me, I always go up and check it. <laughs> uh, I learned my lesson. Uh, I'm not going to eat the artificial one anymore, uh, and, and so forth. So, again, we see here that these scribes and these Pharisees, the way they lived, the front that they were putting on was fake. It was artificial. It wasn't true righteousness coming from a heart uh, of a saved person. Uh, and they had external righteousness. In other words, while everybody was looking or out in public, they prayed, they gave, they did all this stuff. But when nobody was looking, they might have said words they shouldn't have said, talked about things they shouldn't have talked about. In other words, it was just an external, uh, you know, kind of like when we were growing up. Boy, if our parents were in the room or watching, we were perfect little angels. But if they went out that door, you know, those little horns started coming out. And that pitchfork was in our hand uh, because it was just external. I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, I don't want to get a spanking. Uh, I want to, I you know, but then, you know, you start to love your parents and respect your parents and say, I want to do right because I want to please them. I want them to feel good about being a parent and things like that. So that's real. That's being a real good kid, not just a fake good kid. So anyway, we see that's what Matthew chapter 5 is talking about. So Jesus watched uh, us and he wants us to have true righteousness. And again, we, we know the principles are in this Bible. If we do something for self-gratification or for a recognition and, you know, a feel good, fuzzy, warm, warm fuzzy feeling, that is our reward. But if we do it for true righteousness sake... But we will get rewarded in heaven and we can hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So this is where uh, we'll, we'll start in Matthew chapter 5. The righteous began in, in, internal from a heart that was from a saved Christian and righteousness was being applied. That's true righteousness, not fake. But I love the Lord for all he's done for me. This is not even a big deal. <laughs> uh, I didn't get up and go to church today two times to say, you know, warm, fuzzy feeling, self-gratification. Uh, well, I'm the pastor. <laughs> Everybody expects me to be here. It's not, it wasn't for artificial or out, external reasons. Uh, me and the Lord, our relationship was because, Lord, this is your day. <laughs> and the Bible says that I'm supposed to go to church. And I'm supposed to sing about you. And I'm supposed to pray to you. And I'm supposed to learn about you. That's why I want to be here. <laughs> Uh, and, and, you know, it, it, hopefully with God's help, it's real, it's true. It's not Pharisee, Phariseeicalism, or it's not a warm, fuzzy feeling. It's just because God says so. And so that's how all these things that the Bible says blessed are, it's got to come from a true righteous perspective or true righteous heart. So the Pharisees were concerned about the minute details. I mean, dot every I, cross every T. Uh, they, they, were, they were conducting uh, their, their life, uh, but they neglected the major major manner of character. Conduct flows out of character. So again, they did all that they did, prayed, gave, lived, dressed, talked, behaved themselves, all for external. All right, I'm a Pharisee. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a religious leader. I'm this, I'm that. Uh, again, if we do it for that reason, it's going to be burned up. But true righteousness comes from a heart that loves the Lord and is appreciative of what He did. So that's how we can become blessed so we see Jesus gave this message to these saved individuals, not to the lost world. So Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, was to his disciples. Anybody else that wanted to listen and get some, something from it, this is what he was preaching. But he wasn't preaching this to lost people. Preaching to lost people was, you know, you're a sinner. You need to be saved. You can be saved. God loves you. Uh, but this right here, 
God didn't say, okay, all you lost people, if you'll just start living like this, you can be blessed. No. You had to be saved. It had to be true righteousness uh, to, to get these promises and to get these benefits. So he was talking to his disciples. Jesus taught them three things about true righteousness, and that's what we're going to look at tonight. So we're looking at Matthew 5. We'll read verses, I'll just read verses 1 through 16 real quick, uh, and we'll look, number one, what, what true righteousness is. That's what we're looking at in these verses. What true righteousness is. This is not pharisaical checklist, dot every I, cross every T, Christianity. This is for real. And if we're doing it from a heart that loves God, God will do this for us. So seeing the multitudes, he went up into the mountain. And when he was set, he, uh, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So we see here that he's talking to saved, uh, actually saved preachers, people that were following him and preaching for him and helping him get the gospel out. And he was telling them, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, uh, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they which per are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you. Uh, kind of like living the Christian life in this world. <laughs> uh, and even some relatives and things like that. Uh, and it says here, And shall say all manner of evil against you. You think you're better than everybody else. Or you just think this. If that's just happening. It says here, Fall asleep for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. For great is your reward in heaven. If we endure that and say, look, I'm not trying to make you think that I think that I'm better than you. <laughs> I'm just trying to you know, say what the Bible says and live like how God wants me to live and please Him. Uh, and if we're that, we're going to be rewarded in heaven. For persecuted uh, they the prophets which they were before you, and you are the salt of the earth. Uh, and if the salt hath uh, lost its savor, wherein shall it be salted? And so basically we're the salt of the earth. We, we purify it. We cure it. Make it last longer. Uh, and it says it is thenceforth good for nothing. If we've lost our Savior, our savior we're good for nothing. But to be cast out and be trodden under the foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. But on a candlestick and giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that ye may... That they may see your good works and glorify the Father which is in heaven. So the only way to have true righteousness is do it from a heart of character. Uh, I'm a Christian. I'm a child of God. I want to please God with my life. And so this is what true righteousness is. So he's teaching them that. So G Jesus didn't rip the scribes and the Pharisees, but he taught these people. Uh, and so, again, it, it's, it's kind of hard because Jesus loved the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus wanted them to get saved. Jesus wanted them to have exactly what he wanted his disciples to have. So, but what he was saying here was the true righteousness. What they're doing is not true. All right? I love them, but I, and I'm not trying to rip their face off and ridicule them and put them down. Uh, that's not what I'm all about. But I'm letting you know, <laughs> because you have a true heart of character. Don't look down on them. Don't, don't be like them and think you're better than them because you are doing it right. Don't get all puffed up. And so the only reason he's using this situation here is not to rip their face, not to condemn and things like that, but just to show that here's how you get the, the true blessings from God. So these Pharisees taught that righteousness was external from obeying those rules and regulations, and they could be measured by prayers, by fasting, and by giving and all the things. And so, again, they got it out of whack. This is not how to have true righteousness. Uh, being measured like this. Uh, but it says here, the Beatitudes of Jesus came from character and uh, will be formed in those that have character. Uh, because it takes character to do all those things. <laughs> if you're going to be poor in spirit, you're going to have to have character. <laughs> if you're going to have, to, uh, if you're going to live righteously, righteously in this world, you're going to have to have character. <laughs> uh, and so he's told, telling them, these beatitudes will come. So underneath uh, Roman number one, what is true right, what true righteousness is? We got a few things here. We're looking at in verse three our attitude towards ourselves, our attitude towards ourselves. So the Pharisees and the scribes they thought more highly about themselves than they should, and we know the Bible says to not do that. That we ought not think more highly about ourselves than we than we ought. But they did. Boy, they had the the puffed out chest. Uh, you know, the, <clears throat> the, the uh, uh, you know, 
perfectly sounding uh, voices and they, you know, these and thous and they, you know, did all this perfect stuff and it was all about looking and acting and talking. Uh, and so Jesus wasn't saying, okay, hey, I'm not saying chunk the look and chunk the act and chunk the behavior. I'm not saying get rid of that, but I'm saying don't, don't let that be why you do what you do. Uh, nothing wrong with looking nice and nothing wrong with talking respectful and nothing wrong with dotting those I's and crossing those T's, but let's let it come from a heart of, of true heart, not because you're being pharisaical. So our attitude towards ourselves, look what verse 3 says. It says here, blessed, happy, blessed of God are the poor in spirit. Okay, so we're supposed to have a poor spirit about ourselves. Now again, what the devil will do, just like he'll have a counterfeit for everything... <laughs> He had a counterfeit for the Bible. He, he had a counterfeit for how to get to heaven. He had a counterfeit for you know, living the life, things like that. So he jumps on the other side and says, that's right. What you ought to think is you're worthless. You're good for nothing. You ought to die and go to hell. And all that's true. <laughs> but that's not what God's saying. God doesn't want us to go around, eh, poor old me. I think I'll go eat worms and die and all that kind of stuff. Uh, no, the Bible says that we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Uh, and so we can have an opinion that God made me. <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. But again, we see here that the way we, we have to keep that in check. We have to have a, a um, poor basically means humble. Not pitiful and worth nothing. Uh, we must have been worth something for God to send his son to die for us. All right. So it's not that he's like, well, that was a horrible deal. <laughs> I gave my son for all those useless and worthless people. No, he loves us. Uh, so he's not saying to, to have that mentality about yourself, but he's saying be humble. Uh, and I've quoted some of this verse already. Romans 12, 3 says this, For I say, though the grace be given unto you, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly, according as God hath dealt every man the measure of faith. So we're supposed to keep it in perspective. I'm a, I'm a creation of God, so we ought to be pretty happy about that. Uh, I had, God has a perfect will in mind when He created me, so I need to try to find that. We ought to be pretty happy about that. Uh, but again, we ought not let it go to our head. Well, I'll have you know I'm a child of God. And I'll have you know I'm right with God. And I'll have you know I'm living a perfect... No, no, no. We're getting it out of perspective. Keep that poor spirit. Uh, that poor, uh, humble uh, thought process. So poor in spirit does not mean no backbone. Okay, a lot of people, I'm just poor in spirit. No, there's nothing wrong with having a backbone. I'm a child of God. I'm saved. I'm going to do right with God's help no matter what this world thinks. Have a little bit of backbone. Uh, you know, Jesus had a backbone. He was meek, but he wasn't weak. And so nothing wrong with, but the poor in spirit basically doesn't mean not a backbone or weak-minded uh, or I'm not worth anything. And I've already said this, that, you know, we have that verse that says, you know, we are fearfully and wonderfully made. In other words, we're God's creation. Nothing wrong with taking, uh, it's kind of like, you know, your house. Some of you take pride in the way it looks. Okay, you keep it clean, you keep it painted, you keep it, you know, weed-eated and all that stuff. And step back and look, mm-hmm, this is looking nice. I ought to get yard of the month this month. Uh, but anyway, uh, but, you know, again, we're not doing that for a prideful thing. We're just taking care of it. Uh, so same thing with, it, with our bodies and our, our beings. We're, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. We're God's creation. Secondly, that we were bought with a price. Uh, so we're God's child. So we can be poor in spirit, but we can realize that God made me. Secondly, He purchased me. I'm God's creation. I'm God's child. But then we also can say, I'm fulfilling God's will. So I'm God's chosen. So we see these three things. I'm God's creation. I'm God's child. But I'm God's chosen. And that chosen, God did predestinate us. He didn't predestinate some for heaven and some for hell. He predestined all of us to find His will. So if I found God's will, I'm God's chosen. I, that's how I'm going to be blessed. And so we see the poor in spirit, uh, we keep this mindset that I should, I'm just a lost, I mean, I'm just a saved sinner. <laughs> I'm not perfect, I'm forgiven. Have that mindset. I'm not going to think more highly than I ought to. But we can have a little bit of, I'm God's creation. <laughs> I'm God's child. And with His help, I'll find God's will and I'll be God's chosen. So that we can be meek, but not weak. Uh, the word meek in the Greek language, it had a definition. 
and they used this. It was kind of like a broken horse. Not a broken like leg broke or head broke. No, a broken, tamed, you could put a bridle in its mouth. In other words, it was controlled power. That's what meekness is. Okay, we have the power to become the sons of God, the Bible says. We have the power to do God's will through the power of the Holy Spirit. We can have that power, but we need to be tamed. Okay, and we have that you know, controlled power. Uh, so that's the poor in spirit, to have that right mindset, not think of himself more highly than all. So we saw, first of all, the attitude towards ourself. Secondly, let's look at the attitude towards sin, verses 4 through 6. So the first one was, blessed are the poor in spirit. They have the right mindset. I'm, I'm, I'm good for nothing, deserve hell, uh, nothing good about me, but I am God's child, or a creation child, and I'm His chosen. But then I have that mindset, but now we're going to look at sin. How should we look at sin? Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted, because sin causes mourning, uh, and what, whatever that sin, because sin bringeth forth death. And so when we, we, we mourn the death of someone or we mourn the loss of something, we're mourning. Uh, but if we're right with God, we know that God's got everything under control and He's going to comfort us. Uh, number five, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. So I'm going to be meek, not weak. And I'm going to do right uh, with God's help, and I'm going to inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be, be fulfilled or be filled. So we ought to desire righteousness, not sin. So we're looking at our attitude towards sin. I don't want that. Uh, sometimes, you know, your, your mom cooked you some food and there was some mac and cheese. And you wanted two or three helpers of that, but then there was some broccoli. I don't want that. <laughs> I don't want it. <laughs> uh, so we have the power to say, I don't want. Uh, and, you know, sometimes as little kids, you know, you'll get some broccoli and you'll put some peaches on it. And uh, they'll suck the peaches off the top, spit that broccoli back out. Why? They know. Uh, you can't trick them. Uh, so we, we have that power. So it says here that we can have an attitude towards sin. Don't want it. I'm going to stay away from it. Uh, I'm going to spit it out if somebody tries to trick me. Uh, this is our attitude towards sin. In verses uh, 8 says, They're blessed with the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to do right. I want to live righteous. Uh, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. We're trying to reconcile the lost with God. Peacemaking. We're trying to reconcile the prodigal son with the father, peacemaking. Uh, we're trying to reconcile uh, odds against one another, peacemaking. Uh, this is how we do it. This is the, our, our attitude towards sin. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So our attitude towards self, be humble. Our attitude towards sin, don't want it. I'm going to get a rake from it. I'm going to be uh, God's workman and try to reconcile. So we have experience of God's mercy. And so he says that we ought to use it. Uh, and if we use it, we'll get some more. Ephesians 2, 4 and 5 says this, But God, who is rich in mercy, for, for His great love, wherein He hath loved us. And so, the Bible says we're talking about sin here. All right? They sin, so I'm going to put them out. Uh, I don't, that's not what God did. He extended some mercy. So, in verse 5 of that same chapter, it says here, Even when we were dead in sins, He hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. So God says, I've got mercy. I gave it to you. Now what I want you to do according to have your attitude towards sin is you give mercy. Uh, so in other words, if a person does sin, maybe don't write them off. Give them a chance. To pray for them. Maybe point it out and say, look, if you continue to do this, uh, we're, we, we can't hang out or we can't have fellowship or we can't be friends. Uh, but you know, right now I'm trying to have mercy. That's what God, God says, you know, if you got mercy from me, give it to somebody else. And then in turn, I'll give you some more. So God says be merciful, but He says be pure. We're not saying, okay, I'm going to be merciful, so I'm going to go do this sin with you so it makes you feel at home. Mm -mm. I'm going to be pure. Uh, and, then that, and then we're going to be peacemakers. So our attitude towards ourselves, our attitude towards sin. Thirdly, we'll look at our attitude towards God. Our attitude towards God. And of course, uh, you know, if we have the right attitude and it's true righteousness, it's, it's a, the right opinion of God, obviously the Bible says, blessed are they, blessed are they, blessed are they. So if we have the right opinion of God, we are going to be blessed in every possible way. Next, we have the attitude towards the world. Let's look at verses 10 through 16. Uh, blessed are they that persecuted. <laughs> the world's going to persecute you. 
uh, for righteousness sake. If you try to do right, you think you're better. You're Pharisee. You know, and they'll be looking, boy, they'll look to try to find a fault in you. Uh, to try to make themselves feel better about it themselves. So they're going to do that. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us, especially in the book of Proverbs, those ones that are without, those ones that live wickedly, they seek the pure. It's kind of like a trophy. All right, I'll, I'll shoot a spike. Why? Because they eat good. All right, but I'd much rather have an 11 point <laughs> or a 9 point that I can hang on my wall to. People say, well, you can't eat those horns, but yeah, you can look at them. <laughs> All right? I, I have that opinion. So uh, we see the devil, he would like to get some leader, you know, some leader like the president of the Southern Baptist Convention to fall into sin. That would be a great trophy for the devil. But he don't mind shooting spawns and little spikes. He'll do whatever he can. Uh, that's what he wants to do. Uh, so our attitude towards this world, we see here, it, it's not easy for uh, us to be dedicated Christians in this world today. It's not. It's going to be work. It's going to be hard. Society is not afraid uh, and not a friend of God's people uh, or God. There's going to be conflict. Uh, when you would do good, the Bible says, evil presence is with you. We're just going to have to face it. And so our attitude towards this world uh, is uh, it's, there's no use. This world's going to hell in the handbasket. I'm just going to put my face like a flint, just make it through life. No, no, no. <laughs> We're supposed to be that salt. We're supposed to be the light. And we're going to be blessed if we live true righteousness in front of these people. And say, you know, just like this morning, I, I alluded to the fact about uh, the abominations that are taking place in this world. But I also said that God loved them. And I wish they'd get right. And I wish they would get saved. So that's true righteousness. Uh, not let them die and fry and we'll, we'll turn this up. It's, that's not what it's about. We're supposed to be that salt and that light. So the world will praise pride, not humility. The world in, will induce sin, not getting away from sin. But God wants us to reconcile sinful men. He wants us to be used to, in the ministry of reconciliation. So what true righteousness is, is what we saw there. Now secondly, we're going to look at what true righteousness, where or how true righteousness comes. So okay, I want that. I want to be blessed. And I want it to come from a heart, a true, pure heart of loving God, not Phariseeicalism, uh, not just dot and I's and cross and T's, not just rules and regulations. God didn't say get rid of the rules and regulations, but He said do them from a heart of, 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 of humbleness. Uh, and so, how, how does that, where does it come from? How, how does true righteousness come? Verse 17, it says here, Think not that I am come to destroy the law. All right, so He's telling His disciples here, look, this is where it comes from. I didn't come to do away with what the Pharisees, I didn't come to do away with fasting. I didn't come to do away with giving. I didn't come to do away with praying. I didn't come doing away with positions. Uh, I didn't come to do away with, you know, they wore their Pharisaical garb and their phylacteries and all their, you know, get up. He, didn't, he said, I didn't come to do away with that. All right, this is where it came from. This is where true righteousness comes. Verse 17, think not that I am come to destroy the law. Or the prophets, I am not come to destroy but to fulfill. So what they're doing is right. It's right to pray. It's right to fast. It's right to give. It's right to dress right. It's right to have a, a, a be a light and salt and all that stuff. It's right to do that. But they're doing it wrong. They're doing it just for the rules and the regulations and the pat on the back and the warm fuzzy feeling. They're not doing it from a true heart of righteousness. So this is what I want to help them and help you uh, do. I want it to come from the, a true heart. So they have heard of true righteousness, how they can have it, okay, how to, to, how, uh, where, to, where does it come from. And uh, uh, they learned about Moses and the law. It was a schoolmaster. It was to teach us how to do all this stuff. But Jesus came to fulfill it. And it says here, so they thought that the Pharisees and the, the, they were the holiest men in the, in the community. And if they hadn't attained true blessings how in the world can i so they heard jesus say what he's doing the pharisees over there that's wrong <gasps> we've always been taught that that was right and you know we weren't living like that <laughs> we were doing our own thing over here but we respected that we thought that was that was the way that's true righteousness and so now they've got you know they got their lower lip poked out and they're all mad because i thought that was right and you're telling me they're not hmm who do you think you are? And this is what caused all the ruckus. 
Uh, Jesus was pointing out that you know, what they're doing is not wrong. But how they're doing it and their mindset is wrong. What? Uh, and so the, the community was all in an uproar. Uh, and they thought, well, you know, we didn't live like the Pharisees, but we thought they were God's men. So Jesus explained that their attitude towards the law, and he, exp he explained that there was three possible relationships that they could have with the law. Number one, they could destroy it. Uh, and again, I, I've used this phrase even tonight, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. All right, so the Pharisees, they did all this. They dotted all these I's, crossed all these T's. They lived this way. And, and Jesus said, that's not right. So throw it all out. Let's just get rid of it. What, what's the use? If the Pharisees aren't right, according to God, none of us are. So let's just chunk it. And a lot of people have done that. I'm not going to church. There's hypocrites there. And we heard Brother Joe said, there's hypocrites at Walmart, but we still go. Uh, you know, so they, they throw it all out. They said, look, you know, if the Pharisees aren't right, then there's no way I can ever be right. So just hang it. Uh, that's what they'll do. They could, they could destroy it. They could destroy the law. In verse 17, it says, just don't think I come to destroy it. Next, we see here, not only were the Pharisees not like his, they didn't like his authority, they didn't like his activity. So they, st he, they started hearing him saying, the Pharisees and the scribes are not right. They're not doing it right. Uh, they're actually living wickedly. What? And then they, they, that, that got, got their attention, and they started watching him. And then lo and behold, now he's healing people on the Sabbath day. <gasps> Here he is ridiculing the preacher <laughs> and, the, and, the, and the, the, the righteous people, and now he's healing people on the Sabbath day. That's a rule. We don't do anything on the Sabbath day. Uh, and, and so forth. And then they, they, they started get, getting their attentions, and then they, he started attacking their, their traditions. So here he is attacking our religious leaders. Now he's healing people on the Sabbath day, going against our rules. And now he's attacking our traditions. We always do it like that. We've done it like that since, you know, beginning of time. And you know, they were all about keeping their traditions. But Jesus is saying here, look, I didn't come to destroy it. Don't get your you know, feelings, don't get your chip on your shoulder. Uh, and then, so they, we see here that he was... You know, ridiculing their leadership, <laughs> that he was healing people on the Sabbath, he was dogging their traditions, and then the next thing they saw, I saw him eating with a publican. <laughs> you know, now he's hanging out with all the sinners. And so, I mean, it was blowing up. Uh, but they were all about dotting their I's, crossing their T's, not saying throw the I's and the T's out. But we got to do it from a true heart, not just keeping those regulations. So yet the Pharisees were destroying the law with their traditions. <laughs> they were questioning the word of God. They were living hypocritical lives. So uh, Jesus had made it clear that it came, he came to honor the law and to help God's people learn it, love it, and live it from true righteous perspective. Not just keeping of the law for keeping of the law. I want you to keep it because you love God. I want you to keep it because you see what the Bible says and how to do it. Uh, then that's how you're going to be blessed. You're not going to be blessed by dotting your I's, crossing your T's, and your rules and regulations and your traditions. Just for the fact that you're doing them. If you're doing that for the love of God and because God loves you and out of true heart, that's true righteousness. That's how you're going to be blessed. So the Pharisees were artificial. They did not reproduce themselves and others. They were all about keeping the law and doing all this stuff. And everybody was like, I can't do that. So there was no reproduction. There wasn't baby Christians. There wasn't baby Pharisees. But Jesus came and said, look, I want you to do it out of true heart. And when people see you being blessed because of all these things, they're like, I want some of that. And they're like, how'd you get it? Well, I don't deserve it. Only way I got it was by accepting Christ as my personal Savior. It wasn't my keeping this. It wasn't dressing like this. It wasn't talking like this. It wasn't behaving like this. It was just me falling at the feet of Jesus saying, I'm a sinner. Please forgive me. Come to my heart and save me. Well, I can do that. Sure you can. And so that's how people, you know, the Bible says multitudes and multitudes started getting that. So then now the Pharisees are really mad. He's dogged us for our religious you know, activity. <laughs> And he's healed on the Sabbath day, and he's hung out with the sinners, and now look at all. It, there, that gospel's been spread through this whole town. And there's baby Christians popping up everywhere. <laughs> ah! So they were really mad. 
So they, they, they said, he came to destroy it, but he didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. So verse 17, he said, I didn't come to destroy it, but that I come that it might be fulfilled. So this is how it was being fulfilled. So Jesus fulfilled the law in every way. In his birth, Galatians 4, 4 says, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth a son made of a woman, uh, made under the law. So the law said it had to be, you know, born of a virgin, the Messiah. This was, this was for the forgiveness of our sins. And Jesus fulfilled that. I didn't come to destroy it. I came just like the Bible says. Now, you know, all your re- rules and regulations and things like that, going to your head and doing it pharisaical, I'm, I'm, I'm against that. But I came to fulfill the law. Not only did he fulfill it in his birth, he fulfilled it in his boyhood. The Bible says, you know, again, some people maybe take it out of context where he says, you know, woman to his mama. Now, if I said that to my mama, I better duck. All right. You know, in my house, you didn't say, hey, woman. Whew. All right. But Jesus said woman. But it, we know it wasn't out of a disrespectful, uh, you know, it was just a different time. And, you know, m- wished you not, not, must be about my father's business. I, I got to do what God wants me to do. And even in the, in the, on the cross, woman, behold thy son. All right, so he said, John, you know, I'm dying, so you're going to take care of her. Y'all, y'all get together. You don't let her suffer, and you, you do what he says. So he's, t- he's talking to his woman. But in that boyhood, the whole time, he never disrespected them. Uh, you know, where were you at? We've been looking for you for three days. <laughs> you know, we panic in three minutes. Uh, you know, I, my sons used to hide in the clothes racks from their mama, and uh, she would panic, and they'd be in there. <laughs> Giggling, and she that's the only way she could find them is because she could hear him giggling. But anyway, uh, but Jesus never disrespected his mom, so even in his boy, boyhood, he fulfilled the law, even in, in his teenage years. Woo, that was a miracle! <laughs> uh, and then we see here not only in his birth, his boyhood, but then also in his book, he taught that not one jot nor tittle should be added or taken away from. He fulfilled it, okay? He fulfilled the law, he didn't come to destroy it, he came to fulfill it. Uh, and then also he is the becoming of a perfect sacrifice. So the Bible says not, or the law said not one spot, not one blemish. It should be a male lamb. And what did John say? And what did God, God say? John said, behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And God said, this is my beloved son. Hear him. So we see that he came and fulfilled the law, not destroyed it, and all these things. Galatians 3.13 says this, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. So Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. He even became a curse and was hung on the cross. So Jesus didn't destroy the law by fighting against it, but he fulfilled it. So we see here that we can think about the law. We came to seek to destroy it or we can seek to fulfill it. And then thirdly, we can see it and do it. And teach it. Look at verse 19. So whatsoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least of the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do it and teach them, the same shall be called the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And so of course we know we ought not do it for that reason. That becomes Pharisaical again. Because there was a lady that said, hey, hey, I got two boys. When you go back to heaven, can one sit on your left and one sit on your right? He's like, oh, I can't promise that. That's not, that's, not my, that's not my to give. But what you need to tell those boys to do, do true righteousness. You tell them to live right, do right, because the Bible says so, and God will bless them now. And we get to heaven, we'll all get rewards. That's, that, that's not what it's about. Uh, so we see that we came to do it and to teach it. Verse 19, 1 Timothy 1.9 says this, Knowing this, the law is not made for righteous man, but the law, uh, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and the profane, the murderers, <laughs> and the fathers of murderers, and the mothers of manslayers. That's what the law was for. It was to teach those people that's doing wrong. Hey, you're doing wrong. <laughs> it wasn't for the righteous to say, hey, do this so you can get saved. No, you're saved. So because you're saved, do this. Uh, and so we see that uh, nine out of the ten commandments were, rep- uh, re- or I guess, re reported or reprinted in the New Testament. Nine out of the first ten. The only one that's not in the New Testament is the remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. Because in the New Testament we go to church on the first day of the week. Sunday. So the Sabbath was done away with. We don't have to keep it holy anymore. But the first nine 
Jesus didn't do away with them. He went up to them. It says don't commit adultery. I say don't lust. It says don't murder. I say don't hate. And you could just go all the way down. So he, came, he didn't come to destroy it. He came to fulfill it. And so we ought to do it and to teach it. So we see uh, that uh, the first true righteousness, where, what true righteousness is. Secondly, where true righteousness came. And then the third and final thing is how righteousness works. How true righteousness works. And that's verses 21 through 48. We won't take time to read them all. But we'll just pop, cup, pop a couple things down through here. Uh, it says here, The Pharisees said righteousness comes from performing certain actions and staying away from certain actions. So again, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with performing certain actions. Nothing wrong with giving, fasting, praying, dressing right, living right. Nothing wrong with that. But the, 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 the true right, they, they didn't do it for righteousness sake. They did it to fulfill the law and to feel warm and fuzzy about themselves and to get that pat on the back. Jesus says, look, I'm not saying do away with all that. I'm saying do it from a true heart because you love God and then God will bless you. So that's where right, that's how righteousness works. Not staying away from it and not doing certain things. But we ought to stay away from things and we ought to do certain things. But it ought to come from a heart of love for God. So Jesus said uh, it centers its attitude of the heart. This is where true righteousness comes from. It should be centered from the center of us where Jesus is. So anger and murder... Uh, anger is murder and, uh, and, and heart hatred. Lust is adultery in the heart. Or, you know, again, that lust is where that heart comes from, or the lust comes from that wicked heart. So what do we do? Purify and desire a clean heart. That's what the Bible says, that we ought not be double-minded. Don't live right one second and wrong the next. And don't try to, don't try to play this thing. God knows. <laughs> but we ought to purify our hearts, you sinners. And get rid of that double heart, the Bible says. So don't do it uh, for the wrong reasons. Do it for the right reasons. And don't try to mix. And so we, he says here, purify uh, your heart and, and discipline your actions. Uh, the Bible talks about you know, basically bringing this every thought into captivity. And you basically making this body do right. And so we have things like, you know, I'm going to make a promise to you, God, from a true righteousness perspective. I'm not being Pharisee, Pharisaical here. But I'm going to tell you, these eyes, I'm not going to set any wicked thing before them. These eyes, I'm going to make a covenant with you. Uh, and, and I'm going to do that from a true heart. Uh, this mouth, I'm not going to lie with it. I'm not going to gossip or, or backbite or slander with it. Uh, I'm not going to do anything wicked with it. I'm going to use it to spread the gospel. And I'm doing that from a true heart, not to become a Pharisee. Not to get recognition. So again, we ought not throw the good stuff out with the bad. So hands, feet, mind, all those things, we ought to do it from a true, pure heart. Relationships, it says here, pure uh, uh, and, and, and iron sharpeneth iron. Uh, we ought to do that. Let your light so shine. Love your enemies. I mean, just verse after verse comes to mind. Uh, but we ought to do that from a pure heart. So be perfect uh, and we'll complete, be complete and, and have uh, the righteousness of God. So we see Galatians 3.13. It says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. And being made cur that curse for us, he was hung on the tree. And so we ought to realize these things. The book of Matthew, verse chapter 5, tells us what true righteousness is. Doing all the things that the Pharisees did, but doing them for the right reason, out of a true heart that loves God. Then we see here, how does true righteousness come? It not comes from dotting those I's and crossing those T's. It comes from God. And then how do we do it? We put it into practice and live it day in and day out to try to please God. So Matthew chapter 5, uh, obviously lots of verses. You could read 21 through 48. Uh, we got time to read a few of them. But it says, verse 21, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say... That whosoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. For whosoever shall say unto his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool is in danger of hell fire. And so again he was like look I'm not doing it, saying do away with the, the way the Pharisee lives. I'm just saying do it from a heart that's right. And you know I, I know the law says don't kill but let's not get mad. Let's not 
call people names. <laughs> Let's not say thou fool. Uh, verse 23, therefore, if thou bring a gift to the altar, therefore remember that thy brother hath ought against thee. Leave thy gift before the altar, and go thy way first reconciled to thy brother, and then come offer the gift. Agree uh, with the adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him. Lest at any time thy adversary deliver thee the judge, and the judge deliver thee into the officer, and thou shalt be cast into prison. You know, get some things right here. <laughs> Let's not be deceptive and be arguing with each other. Verily I say unto you, thou shalt by no means come out thence till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing. Ye have heard that it was said in old time, or by them in old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto them, whosoever looketh on a woman, and lusts after her, hath committed adultery with, with her already in his heart. Uh, if I, I right eye offend thee, pluck it out. Uh, and it goes on to say it'd be better. And so uh, I, I had a, a guy ask me, does that mean I need to pluck my eyeballs out? And I was like, I think God's putting the thing here on, you know, on the perspective. All right? He wants you to just not look in lust. <laughs> but it would be better if you're going to look in lust to pull it out so you don't. But what he's saying is don't look in lust. And so that's what he's saying. I came to fulfill the law, not to destroy it. So, uh, amen. Praise the Lord for the, the um, be attitudes, the blessed are they's. But if we want that true blessing, it has to come from a true heart of true righteousness not Phariseeism. So let's have a word of prayer and uh, we'll have an invitation. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity we have to serve you. And Lord, thank you for the word of God. Uh, Lord, we know that uh, throughout our world there's different opinions, there's different religions. Uh, obviously, Satan's going to cause confusion because we know he's the author of it. Uh, but obviously, you came to fulfill it and to make it plain. Uh, and obviously, Lord, thank you for the plainness of chapter 5. If you want to be blessed, you're going to have to do it for the right reasons, not for self-gratification, not for uh, power and prestige amongst the people, but because we love you and we want to try to please you. So Lord, help us all to live that way. Let's all stand. Uh, Brother Derek's going to lead us in the invitation. If you'd like to come ask God or thank God, altar is open. Bible says that, that, you know, I'll paraphrase here, but we ought to, if possible, the Bible says, if possible, live peaceably with all men. And so it's, it's in, you know, in our power in our in trying to be in our ability to live at peace with everybody. So, you know, if you look at the characters here, you had the Pharisees, they were doing right, but for just right sake and for braggadocious, uh, you know, power and things like that. Then you have Jesus come in. And teach true righteousness. So then you had people that had to make a choice. And so, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep doing what the Pharisees did. I'm not going to do away with that, but I'm going to do it because Jesus says it's right and I want him to bless me. Then you're going to have people coming and saying, you're doing it for the Pharisaism. And, you know, and oh. say, no, no, I'm not. I promise. If, if I'm coming across that way, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just a wicked, rotten sinner that deserves a burning hell. I'm just trying my best. To live like God wants me to do. And if hopefully that appeases it. You're living peaceably. But if they're like, I don't believe it. You're just self-righteous. You're just Pharisee. I tried. <laughs> All right. I'm not going to not live right just to fix that relationship. <laughs> because this relationship's more important than that one. <laughs> That's what it's saying. So some people, they're not going to believe you no matter how you try. <laughs> they're, you know, you look, I do this for God. I love God. Mm -hmm. you're just trying to get recognition you, you think you're all that in a bag of chips and <sighs> no <laughs> all right i'm not i promise and uh so but with all possible live peaceably with all men but again <laughs> amen all right let's see here brother wade you dismiss us in prayer